The Shadows of Paris written by Cyprian Jossin, Chapter 2, Eyes on Her. In Mama d'Amour's Siva d'Afrique, the atmosphere became tense with secrets and intrigues enveloping Ifioma. It felt as though she was a fragile butterfly ensnared in a web of deceit spun by the very hands meant to nurture her. Mama d'Amour, supposed to be Ifioma's protector, harbored less than pleasant intentions, she was covertly wishing for Ifioma to face failure. A devious plan unfolded, with Mama D'Amour orchestrating it all, manipulating the situation. Amanada, a sly Senegalese lady, and Anita from Cameroon, two pawns enticed by Mama D'Amour's tricks, united against Ifioma. However, there was a surprising twist, Marie de Reese, seemingly part of the plan, was concealing her true feelings. Although tasked with monitoring Ifioma's every move, Marie de Reese secretly admired Ifioma's resilience. Behind the scenes, Marie de Reese's past mirrored Ifioma's challenging journey, from the unforgiving Libyan desert to the clandestine night bus that transported them both to the heart of France. In the clandestine meeting at Mama D'Amour's restaurant, the air was thick with secrecy and malicious intent. Mama D'Amour, a mastermind draped in shadows, addressed her conspirators. Ladies, our little Nigerian friend, Ifioma, has become a nuisance. We need to get rid of her, and I have a plan. Amanada, with a wicked grin, what's the plan, Mama? She's undocumented, right? We can use that against her. Let's anonymously tip off the police about her status. They'll do the dirty work for us, Mama Damore said. Anita, eager to contribute said, I can trick her into some shady dealings, get her caught up in illegal activities, and the police won't hesitate to take her away. Mama D'Amour, nodding, excellent, Anita. We'll create a web of deceit around her. Marie de Reese, you keep a close eye on her. Let us know her movements and romantic rendezvous with Guillaume. Marie de Reese, feigning loyalty, consider it done, Mama. She won't suspect a thing. Without a doubt, Ifioma's magnetic aura and amiable personality transformed Siva d'Afrique into a culinary haven attracting clients with the promise of not only delectable dishes, but also a warm, inviting atmosphere. Her infectious smile and genuine hospitality became the restaurant's signature, establishing Mama D'Amour's establishment as a favorite among Parisians seeking a taste of Africa. The clientele couldn't resist the allure of Ifioma's charm, and Mama D'Amour couldn't help but notice the dwindling numbers in her once-thriving restaurant. A quarter of the customers had shifted their loyalty, enchanted by Ifioma's welcoming presence. The vibrant ambience she had once created with her laughter and genuine interest in each customer's experience resonated far beyond the flavors of the dishes. However, now it had disappeared, leaving the restaurant with nothing but her shadows, which lingered in all the corners of the place, like an epic poem. Ifioma's popularity was a thorn in Mama D'Amour's side, and the conspirators, sensing the threat to their nefarious plan, intensified their efforts to tarnish Ifioma's reputation. One day, as Mama D'Amour circulated among the tables, a curious regular client couldn't help but voice his admiration for Ifioma. Where is the smiling young lady who brings happiness to this place? he inquired. Mama D'Amour, quick on her feet with a fabricated story, responded with a scowl. She stole money from our save, she declared, attempting to cast a shadow over Ifioma's radiant image. The client, intrigued by the accusation, pressed further, so, did you report her to the police? Mama D'Amour hesitated for a moment, a flicker of uncertainty, crossing her face. No, I didn't want her to go to jail, she answered, feigning concern. Without Mama D'Amour realizing it, her effort to ruin Ifioma's reputation only made the clients feel more sympathetic towards the charming waitress. Whispers and murmurs circulated in the restaurant, and Mama D'Amour's manipulation started to fall apart as Ifioma's popularity remained strong. In the next few days, Mama D'Amour persisted in her attempts to turn customers against Ifioma by spreading malicious lies. However, Ifioma's genuine kindness and friendly nature had a more profound impact than the fabricated stories. The clients, who had come to appreciate the warm and welcoming environment that Ifioma cultivated, started questioning Mama D'Amour's true intentions. Even the typically delicious Nigerian fried rice, a staple prepared by Ifioma, seemed to lose its flavor in the eyes of the customers influenced by the rumors. 
The once jingling cash register no longer chimed as frequently, reflecting a decline in business for Mama Damour's establishment. The financial losses piled up, revealing the consequences of her underhanded tactics. Marie de Ries, the easygoing dishwasher, strongly disliked unfairness. She came from the Central African Republic and was a kind, quiet person who had sought asylum and, eventually, gained her status due to humanitarian reasons. Marie Therese had simple beauty and a calm manner that was different from the busy feel of Mama Damour's restaurant. Her warm brown eyes showed a quiet strength, and her curly hair simply framed her face. She carried herself with quiet grace, often not noticed among the livelier personalities in the restaurant. Despite being laid back, Marie Therese had a caring heart that burned with a passion for justice and fairness. Even though she seemed calm, she couldn't bear to see unfairness. Having faced challenges while seeking asylum, she understood the struggles of those in similar situations. One day, as she quietly watched Mama Damour's tricky plans against Ifioma, Marie Therese felt a strong sense of anger. The injustice against a fellow immigrant stirred a feeling of responsibility in her. Fueled by her own experiences, she couldn't just watch Ifioma's good name being tarnished. Marie Therese made her way to the grand residence Guillaume La Chase had acquired in the illustrious 16th arrondissement of Paris, an opulent district synonymous with wealth and privilege. Positioned just in front of the building, the names of its fortunate occupants were inscribed on the right side, accompanied by a press button to summon them. With determination, Marie Therese located Guillaume La Chase's name and firmly pressed the button. A female voice inquired, Say, Ka? Who is it? Marie de Ries, she responded. Push the door and take the elevator to the fourth floor, Ifioma instructed. As the brown wooden door creaked open, Marie de Ries stepped into the lap of luxury that adorned the compound, embellished with vibrant flowers. As she patiently awaited the arrival of the lift, two ladies emerged, their gazes averted and silent as Marie de Ries offered a polite greeting. Once inside the elevator, she pressed the button that would ascend her to the fourth floor where Ifioma awaited her arrival. The gentle hum of the ascending lift surrounded Marie de Ries as she contemplated what she would tell her, the dirty plot of Mama d'Amour. When the doors finally parted on the fourth floor, she was met by Ifioma, who welcomed her with a warm smile. Marie de Ries, it's good to see you. What brings you here? Ifioma asked. Ifioma, we need to talk. There's something you should know. What is it? Why the secrecy? Ifioma looked concerned. Mama Damour is plotting against you. She's spreading lies and trying to tarnish your reputation in the restaurant. What? Why would she do that? Ifioma surprised. It's a long story, but I couldn't stand by and watch her injustice. She's trying to turn the customers against you. But why? What does she gain from this? Ifioma asked. I think it's about control and power. Maybe she sees you as a threat. Well, she won't succeed. I won't let her destroy what I built here, Ifioma said. That's why I'm here. I thought you should be aware. And there's more. I believe you should confide in Guillaume. He might be able to help you with your papers, especially if you two decide to get married. Guillaume? You think he'd help? Ifioma surprised. He's not like Mama Damour. I've seen him stand up against injustice. You can trust him, Marie Therese assured her. Thank you, Marie Therese. I appreciate your honesty and support. We're in this together. I will tell you how I got my refugee status and how to go about it. Marie Therese shared with Ifioma her journey to obtaining refugee status, detailing the interview process she underwent. As Ifioma listened attentively, Marie Therese explained the crucial elements the immigration officers focused on during the interviews. When you go for the interview, they'll inquire about your details, your full name, the names of your parents and siblings. After that, they delve into the reason you left Nigeria for France. What else are they looking for during the interview? There are specific categories they consider for granting refugee status. First, if you're fleeing due to religious persecution. Second, if your involvement in politics or any political party puts you in danger. The third category involves persecution based on your ethnicity.
Fourth, if you're a member of a minority group, such as being homosexual or lesbian, what if you don't fit into any of these categories? Ifeoma asked another question. If you don't fall into those categories, there's still a chance. The fifth reason is humanitarian grounds. This applies if you've gone through the process and have been refused refugee status. For instance, you can state that you have no family left, they're deceased, and returning to your country means no one will care for you, especially if you're sick. In such cases, they might ask you to go to the prefecture to request documentation proving your medical condition. But the problem is that I went to the first interview and they said my story is not true. What do I do now? Do you think I will be given another chance? Ifeoma asked her. It's not uncommon for the first interview to be challenging. They might doubt your story initially, but you have the right to appeal and provide more evidence during the second interview. Appeal? What kind of evidence do they want? Ifeoma asked. It varies, Ifeoma. They could ask for additional documents, perhaps more details about your situation in Nigeria. It's essential to be prepared, share the most accurate information, and address any concerns they may have raised during the first interview. I don't want to go back to Nigeria. There has to be something I can do, Ifeoma said. Absolutely, Ifeoma. The appeal process is an opportunity to present a stronger case. You can gather more information, maybe seek legal advice, and emphasize the reasons why returning to Nigeria would pose a threat to you. Legal advice? Where can I find help? There are organizations and legal aid services that specialize in immigration cases. I can help you connect with some contacts who might guide you through the process, Marie Therese said. Marie Therese pulled a sheet of paper from her black bag revealing a template for a compelling story under humanitarian grounds that had granted her friend Jane asylum status. Jane, like you, arrived in France at the age of 25. Her narrative began with the journey from Nigeria to Kano, crossing Agadia, and eventually finding herself in Libya, where she engaged in prostitution for two months. With the money earned, she paid the smuggler who facilitated her journey to Italy. Upon reaching Italy, Jane entered into a wretched bargain, working as a prostitute for a woman who had sponsored her trip. Astonishingly, she managed to pay back around 40,000 euros to this woman, catching the attention of Opfra agents. A significant question arose, how many men had she slept with? Jane clarified that her clients paid between 10 to 20 euros, leading to the shocking revelation that she might have slept with 2,000 men to accumulate that amount. Eventually, Jane fled from the woman who claimed she owed an additional 15,000 euros. Her refugee status was granted due to the danger she faced from the Nigerian mafia gang in Italy if she were to return to Nigeria, they would easily catch her. So, do you want me to write my story for the interview like this one? Ifeoma inquired. If you believe your experience shares similarities with Jane's, then yes, Marie Therese replied. The door swung open and Guillaume came in with a warm smile on his face. He carried a bunch of colorful flowers, their bright tones matching Ifeoma's radiant smile. The sweet scent of the fresh flowers filled the room, creating an atmosphere of excitement. Guillaume offered the bouquet to Ifeoma, and the soft petals gently touched her fingers as she took the gift. The room felt vibrant, filled with the colors of the blossoms and the emotions shared between the two. Marie Therese watched the subtle exchange of feelings between them, witnessing a love that was passionate and deep. But it wasn't just the flowers that Guillaume presented, nestled within the bouquet was an envelope, bearing the promise of a love poem. The weight of the words inside added a layer of anticipation, like a treasure waiting to be unveiled. Ifeoma's eyes sparkled with a mix of surprise and delight as she carefully opened the envelope. The room hushed as if holding its breath while Ifeoma's magnetic eyes scanned the lines of the love poem. The verses, a heartfelt confession of love and admiration, lifted her spirits, carrying her to a joyful cloud. It was a feeling akin to a child's desire to linger in the womb or to stay in the bliss of infancy. Marie Therese couldn't help but marvel at the scene before her, the exchange of flowers, the poetry of unspoken words, and the genuine love between them. It was a moment frozen in time, a canvas painted with the hues of blossoming affection. The ambience was set with music, and aperitifs were served, 
accompanied by cheers to celebrate the heart of two lovers. As the evening wrapped its gentle embrace, Ifioma, inspired by the cooking tips she learned from a skilled French chef during a month-long internship, set out to create a delicious masterpiece, Coco Vin. This fantastic recipe, already simmering in the cooker, could leave Mama Damour regretful for missing out on such talent. In the heart of the kitchen, Ifioma showcased her skill, her hands, gracefully mixing each ingredient. A plump chicken, soaking in the rich essence of red wine, sat surrounded by a medley of flavors, mushrooms, savory pork, onions, garlic, and a touch of brandy. Each element added its special touch to the harmonious blend she crafted, a mix of scents that filled the air, promising a delightful culinary evening. Ifeoma, this aroma is enchanting. What's the secret behind this delightful dish? Guillaume asked. Ah, Guillaume, it's not just about the ingredients. Cooking is like telling a story, a tale of flavors that dance together. This coco vin holds tales of a French chef who generously shared his kitchen wisdom with me. A French chef? Tell us more, Ifioma, Marie Therese intrigued, yes, when I worked in his restaurant, he shared some of his tricks with me. Every ingredient is like a character, playing a role in the story of a meal. It's called the chef's secret. Guillaume sipping his wine, so, every dish has a story? Exactly, Guillaume, Ifioma answered. It's like you're sharing pieces of your journey through food, Marie Therese said. Precisely, Marie Therese. Food has a way of bridging gaps and telling stories that go beyond words. This coco vin is more than just a dish, it's a chapter of my culinary adventures. Well, I'm lucky to have a beautiful sweetheart, like Ifioma who can cook both African and French dishes. I love you, my dear, Guillaume told Ifioma and kissed her on the forehead. Ifioma raising her glass said, to shared stories and the beautiful blend of cultures. Marie Therese and Guillaume, in unison, to shared cultures. The delightful aroma of coco vin filled the living room, signifying more than just the preparation of a meal, it marked a celebration of heritage and the fusion of diverse culinary traditions. The dining table, meticulously arranged, showcased Ifioma's culinary expertise. Hailing from Igbo land, she crossed the desert to France, drawing inspiration from her experiences, including her time at the Siva d'Afrique restaurant when she worked for Mama d'Amour and other places that honed her marketable skills in France. As they sat at the table, enjoying the delicious meal, Guillaume La Chase, his eyes holding a certain charm, shared that he worked as a plainclothes police inspector. He made it clear that he couldn't disclose the specifics of his job, but wanted them to be informed. Ifioma, seizing the opportunity, inquired if he knew about her status as an illegal immigrant or sans papier. With confidence, Guillaume replied, perfectly well. Marie Therese couldn't shake the feeling of destiny, guiding them into uncharted territories. Guillaume's love for Ifioma wasn't to help her with her immigration status, it was about her warm smile, genuine laughter, and kind heart that won him over. Despite that he was white and she was black, a big gap in their social status, their love was strong. As they continued their dinner, Guillaume poured red wine to accompany the coco vin. The rich aroma of the wine blended with the flavorful dish, creating an atmosphere filled with subtle romance. Their conversation shifted to lighter topics, exploring shared interests and dreams, the clinking of glasses and the intimate exchange of glances to celebrate the moment. So, Ifioma, tell us more about your dreams. What do you aspire to do? Guillaume La Chase asked her. Well, besides working for other people, I've always dreamed of opening a big restaurant, a place where people can feel at home and enjoy delicious food. That sounds wonderful. And you, Guillaume? Any dreams you'd like to share? Marie, Therese said. I dream of making a difference, even in small ways. Being a police inspector is not enough for me, but if I can bring a bit of joy and justice into someone's life, it's fulfilling. Guillaume La Chase, born into a middle-class family in the charming city of Lyon, grew up surrounded by a strong sense of compassion and justice, except when the conversation touched on French influence in Africa. His father, Henri La Chase, a respected professor at the University of Lyon, specializing in anthropology, held differing views on the evolution theory of life in Africa. Guillaume's mother, Claire, worked as a nurse. From a young age, 
Guillaume saw the importance of empathy and understanding through his friends and neighbors. Raised in a nurturing environment, he learned from the warmth of family ties. His parents instilled in him a strong moral compass and a belief in the transformative power of education to bridge societal gaps. Excelling in his studies, Guillaume's intellectual curiosity led him to pursue a law degree at La Sorbonne in Paris. During his university years, Guillaume's perspective broadened as he encountered diverse viewpoints. He witnessed the struggles of immigrants sleeping outside during winter and actively participated in student movements against racism. Many of Guillaume's closest friends were of African descent, and these friendships influenced his views on black people living in Paris. In the face of accusations from fellow French citizens blaming them for various issues, such as taking jobs and supposedly exploiting free healthcare, Guillaume saw beyond stereotypes. His experiences during this period strengthened his resolve to fight against injustice. The friends he made with people from different countries left a lasting impact on him. Choosing to become a police inspector wasn't just a career move for Guillaume, it was an extension of his commitment to making a positive impact. His university and activism experiences fired his determination to bring change within the system. Joining the police force, he believed, allowed him to contribute to a more just and inclusive society. Throughout his youth, Guillaume held on to the belief in a world without borders. His dream of making a difference, even in small ways, came true when he fell in love with Ifeoma. As a police officer, he intervened to stop some colleagues from unjustly arresting people based on their color. Guillaume remained loyal to his belief that every individual, regardless of color, deserves dignity and equality. However, Guillaume experienced heartbreak. Once a romantic soul, he plunged into depression when his French fiancé, Emile, left him for his best friend, Johnny. Their envisioned love story shattered, leaving him in despair. Emile and Johnny's betrayal hit Guillaume like a sudden storm, and the pain lingered, casting a shadow even in his brightest moments. The engagement ring, once a symbol of love, became a heavy reminder of shattered hopes. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, as Guillaume wrestled with the darkness enveloping his heart. He withdrew from the world, seeking solace in solitude. The vibrant colors of life faded to muted shades, and the melodies of joy were drowned out by the melancholy symphony of heartbreak. His friends, aware of his pain, tried to coax him out of his desolation. They invited him to social gatherings and encouraged him to meet new people, but Guillaume remained imprisoned by the memories of a love that had slipped away. The turning point came when Guillaume decided that love was a treacherous terrain, best left unexplored. He embraced a stoic resolve, bowing to shield his heart from the vulnerability of romantic entanglements. His career as a police inspector became a refuge, a place where logic and order provided a semblance of control in the chaos of his emotions. The void left by Emile's departure seemed insurmountable until fate intervened. In the ordinary course of life, Guillaume crossed paths with Ifeoma. She, too, carried the weight of a complicated past, and in their shared stories, Guillaume discovered a connection that transcended the scars of heartbreak. Ifeoma's warmth and love lit up Guillaume's life and began to melt the icy walls around Guillaume's heart. Her contagious laughter became the light and energy guiding him out of the abyss of his previous heartache. As they shared meals, exchanged stories, and talked about life's challenges together, Guillaume found a renewed sense of purpose and the courage to open his heart once more. She, a lovely lady from Igbo land, Nigeria, became his support. Their love was strong and comforting. She wasn't just his girlfriend but someone who shared his feelings and helped him heal from past hurts. The pain from his earlier relationship faded away, replaced by the soothing presence of the Nigerian woman. Guillaume La Chase emerged from the cocoon of his love disappointment, transformed and revitalized. In Ifeoma, he found his soulmate, his whole life, and a wellspring of positive energy. In the quiet countryside of Lyon, where green vineyards covered the land, Guillaume made a bold move by bringing Ifeoma to meet his family. Their family home, surrounded by vegetation, was both beautiful and green. When they entered, it felt like something wasn't right. Guillaume's mother, Madame La Chase, didn't seem to like Ifeoma, and his father, Monsieur La Chase, was shocked that his son could choose a black woman. What's your origin? 
Monsieur La Chase inquired, cutting through the awkward silence. I'm from Nigeria, Ifeoma replied. Ah, Niger. I worked in Niame some years ago, Monsieur La Chase remarked. Papa, ma chérie Ifeoma is from Nigeria, an English-speaking country in West Africa. She is not from Niger, Guillaume corrected. Even so, El Noir, Mon Fils, she is black, my son, Madame La Chase stated with a touch of sarcasm, reinforcing her disdain for the presence of an African lady in the family. Monsieur La Chase continued his questioning, Why did you come to France? I am seeking political asylum in France, Ifioma responded. Is there any war in your country? Madame La Chase probed, awaiting a response that would support her preconceived notions. No, madam. It is more complicated than that, Ifioma calmly explained. Can we change the subject and leave her alone? She is my choice, and there is nothing both of you can do, Guillaume asserted, trying to defend his lover. Guillaume, tu es tombe dans la tête, Guillaume you have lost your mind, stressed Madame La Chase. She left the living room and retreated to the bedroom, unwilling to share space with Guillaume and the black woman. In France, it can be challenging when people of different races, such as white and black, are in a relationship. This difficulty is evident even when a black woman is seen with a white man in public, as was the case in the La Chase family home. Guillaume, a white man, brought Ifioma, a black woman, to meet his family, causing discomfort, especially for his mother, Madame La Chase. The La Chase family's situation mirrors that of many others in France. Typically, older individuals appreciate Africans who come to perform tasks like cleaning their homes or assisting with various responsibilities. However, even in these roles, black individuals may encounter problems. While engaged in cleaning or caring for someone who is sick, the older generations express their displeasure, questioning the presence of black people in France. Guillaume's decision to introduce Ifioma challenged his parents' preconceived notions. When Monsieur La Chase inquired about Ifioma's background and her reason for being in France, it exposed the resistance of a generation clinging to outdated ideas. Madame La Chase's reminder that Ifioma was black highlighted the preconceptions about how some people in France perceive immigrants. This family encounter reflected a bigger issue in society. It highlighted the conflict between how black people are accepted when they do certain jobs and how they are rejected when it comes to equal relationships. The struggle for acceptance wasn't only happening in the La Chase family, but also in the streets, where couples faced judgmental looks and whispers from people. Guillaume and Ifioma left the family house that day, and he vowed never to visit them again. Say ma vie, it's my life, he firmly declared to his parents. In response, Madame La Chase yelled at them, proclaiming, We will not attend your marriage, as she briskly crossed the expansive living room, heading to the kitchen for some coffee. La Negresse Amer but notre fils, the black woman has charmed our son, Monsieur La Chase consoled his wife, deepening the tension between them. Ifioma couldn't hold back her tears as Guillaume drove away from his parents' home. The realization that these were his parents, holding such biased views, weighed heavily on him. Despite this, his strong belief in equality between blacks and whites remained intact. I will teach our children to love people whether they are black or white, he comforted Ifioma. Then, he dropped a bombshell, I want you to be the mother of my children. This revelation took Ifioma by surprise. As they continued their journey, Guillaume explained his decision. He couldn't let his parents' prejudices dictate his life. I am my own person, he affirmed. I will build a family that values love and acceptance. Ifioma, still taken aback by the sudden proposal, asked, Are you sure, Guillaume? This is a big step, especially considering your family. Guillaume nodded, his eyes reflecting determination. I am sure. I love you, and I won't let anything stand in our way. You know I have no papers to live in this country, Guillaume. I am a sans-papier, an undocumented immigrant living in France. I can be deported any time, Ifioma reminded him. You don't need to worry about that. Things will fall into place when we show our love to the world, Guillaume reassured her. How are you going to do it? Ifioma inquired, her eyes reflecting a mix of anxiety and hope. Do you trust me? 
Guillaume asked, looking deeply into her eyes. Yes, Guillaume, I Fiona replied, her voice filled with sincerity. I prefer you say yes, my love, not yes, Guillaume, he playfully teased. Yes, my love, I Fiona intoned, a soft smile forming on her lips. That's my girl, Guillaume said, his affectionate tone soothing her worries. In the days that followed, Guillaume worked tirelessly to find a solution to Ifioma's precarious immigration status. He sought legal advice, connected with immigration experts, and explored every avenue to regularize her stay in France. His determination to overcome this obstacle reflected his commitment to Ifioma and their shared future. Late one evening, after a series of meetings and consultations, Guillaume returned home with a hopeful gleam in his eyes. He held Ifioma's hands gently and said, I've been talking to immigration lawyers, and we have a plan. It won't be easy, but with time and perseverance, we can go through this. Ifioma, grateful for his efforts, asked, What's the plan, Guillaume? We'll start by gathering all the necessary documents, evidence of our relationship, and your contributions to the community. We'll build a strong case that demonstrates your integration into French society, he explained. The marriage of Guillaume La Chase and Ifioma Ugwa happened in the Mary of the 16th arrondissement before the friends of Guillaume and Marie, Therese Bada, who was Ifioma's witness. The family and siblings of Guillaume did not attend the marriage. All the same, he was not surprised because they have always voted for the far-right party in France whose ideology was against immigrants coming to benefit from the French social welfare system and polluting the French culture with their food, music, and women having many children in France. Others tend to bring their families from Africa to France. On the auspicious day of their marriage at the Mary of the 16th arrondissement, Guillaume and Ifioma adorned themselves in attire that resonated with both elegance and cultural significance. Guillaume, dressed in a tailored navy blue suit, exuded sophistication. His crisp white shirt, paired with a silver silk tie, complemented the formal yet stylish ensemble. A single white rose adorned his lapel, a symbol of purity and new beginnings. Your parents did not come, Ifioma pointed out. I'm so glad they are not here, Guillaume replied. Ifioma looked stunning in her traditional Igbo wedding outfit. The George wrapper, with lively red, gold, and green patterns, flowed elegantly. The matching blouse, decorated with detailed beads and embroidery, highlighted her beauty. Around her neck, she wore a coral bead necklace symbolizing prosperity and love. Her head was adorned with a perfectly tied gelly. Marie de Rees, proudly standing as Ifioma's witness, wore a stylish knee-length dress in a chic shade of lavender. The flowing fabric moved gracefully with her, giving a feminine touch. She added a silver pendant and earrings, completing the elegant and sophisticated look. Pierre Leroux, Guillaume's best man, chose a classic charcoal gray suit that had a timeless look. He wore a crisp white shirt and a deep burgundy tie, giving his outfit a touch of elegance. The ceremony at the city hall began with the mayor sharing heartfelt words about love, commitment, and the journey that awaited Guillaume and Ifioma. Standing hand in hand, the mayor encouraged them to stay faithful to each other as they exchanged solemn vows. The mayor asked Guillaume, Do you, Guillaume La Chase, take Ifioma as your lawfully wedded wife? Guillaume responded with a strong, Yes, I do. The same question was posed to Ifioma, and she, too, replied with a resounding, Yes, I do. After the official ceremony, the joyous group of about sixty friends headed to a lavishly decorated hall for the cocktail and wedding party. The venue sparkled with fairy lights and floral arrangements, creating an atmosphere of enchantment. Tables adorned with white linen cloths and vibrant centerpieces hosted the guests, who eagerly awaited the newlyweds. The couple's first dance was a mesmerizing moment, symbolizing the union of two souls. The room was filled with laughter, clinking glasses, and heartfelt toasts. A delectable spread of French and Nigerian cuisines graced the buffet, pleasing the diverse palate of the attendees. The wedding cake, a stunning creation in white and gold, took center stage, ready for the ceremonial cutting. The night started with a mix of music, dance, and celebration. A live band played tunes that blended French and Nigerian influences, bringing the two cultures together in a joyful celebration.
Guillaume and Ifeoma danced and laughed with friends and unfamiliar faces throughout the night. The wedding festivities continued into the early hours, filled with the rhythms of celebration and the cheerful laughter of friends and family. As the night embraced the couple, Guillaume and Ifeoma felt the magic of their union lingering in the air. Eventually, they decided to say goodbye to the lively festivities and head to their luxurious home. The journey back was a quiet moment, a special time for the newlyweds to think about the magical day they had just experienced. Guillaume looked at Ifeoma with gratitude and love in his heart. The soft glow of the streetlights highlighted Ifeoma's face, revealing the radiance that had captured his heart from the first moment they met. When they arrived home, there was a sense of excitement in the air. Guillaume opened the door, and they entered a home filled with the scent of their promises and the beginning of their shared dreams. Soft music played in the background, creating a gentle atmosphere that enveloped them like a warm hug. In the quiet living room of their home, Guillaume took Ifeoma's hands in his, his eyes expressing the depth of his feelings. Tonight has been magical, my love, he whispered, his words spreading joy in their hearts and reflecting on the wonders and power of love. Ifeoma, feeling the same sentiment, smiled with a mixture of joy and contentment. Yes, it has, she replied, her eyes reflecting the flickering candlelight. The room seemed to hold its breath as they savored the quiet intimacy of the moment. Guillaume guided Ifeoma to a room decorated with petals and candles, creating a romantic setting within the walls of their home. They swayed to a melody that mirrored the rhythm of their hearts. With each step, they danced a dance that symbolized a promise of forever, through the highs and lows of life. As they held each other close, Guillaume whispered sweet words, expressing his love and gratitude to the woman who had become his wife. Ifeoma, with her bright smile and steady gaze, bore the burden of a secret love affair from her past in Nigeria, a love she believed she had left behind, yet it lingered in the depths of her heart like a bittersweet melody. Her secret rendezvous with Ikeokike, her former fiancé, cast a shadow over the passionate moments she experienced with Guillaume. The forbidden love from her past became a burden she couldn't shake, it tormented her. She had promised Okiakike the marriage that Guillaume had taken away from him. Guillaume, blissfully ignorant of Ifeoma's hidden turmoil, reveled in the joy of being with the woman he had chosen to be his life partner. Yet, the fates had interwoven their destinies in a way that tested the resilience of their love. Ifeoma's secret, a lingering ember from her past, threatened to ignite a tempest that could shatter the idyllic facade of their marriage. The whispers of forbidden love echoed in the chambers of Ifeoma's heart, and the weight of her hidden emotions bore down on her like a heavy cloak. She grappled with the guilt of keeping a piece of her past, concealed from the man who had vowed to love and cherish her. The contrast between the passionate embraces with Guillaume and the distant echoes of a love she had left behind left her torn between two worlds. In the softly lit room, as Guillaume held her close, Ifeoma wrestled with a storm of conflicting emotions. The boundaries between her past and present blurred, and the forbidden love that lingered in the shadows threatened to surface, casting a shadow over the comfort of their marital bliss. Ifeoma stood in the bathroom, the sound of running water enveloping her as she enjoyed a refreshing shower. The persistent ring of her phone resonated through the apartment, prompting Guillaume to hastily answer. A man's anxious voice on the other end asked for Ifeoma. Who are you? Guillaume asked, his concern evident in his tone. The caller remained silent and abruptly ended the call. Guillaume's furrowed brow betrayed the realization that Ifeoma had been nursing a secret. Draped in a towel, Ifeoma emerged from the bathroom to find Guillaume deep in thought. Sensing his unease, she asked, who was on the phone? Some guy asking for you. He didn't say anything and hung up, Guillaume replied, trying to gauge Ifeoma's reaction. Ifeoma's expression remained composed, but a flicker of anxiety crossed her eyes. I have no idea who that could be. Maybe a wrong number, she suggested, though her attempt to downplay the situation lacked conviction. Guillaume's eyes bore into hers, searching for any signs of deception. Ifeoma, we promised each other no secrets. What's going on? Ifeoma hesitated, a mix of emotions playing on her face. It's nothing, Guillaume. Probably a telemarketer or a wrong number, like I said. 
Guillaume, unconvinced, pressed further, you've been acting strangely lately. Is there something you're not telling me? Ifeoma sighed, her shoulder slumping slightly. Guillaume, it's not about keeping secrets. There are just things from my past that I'd rather forget. Guillaume took a step closer, his hand reaching out to gently touch hers. We're in this together, Ifeoma. Whatever it is, we face it together. Ifeoma met his gaze, her eyes reflecting a mix of gratitude and apprehension. It's just, someone from Nigeria. An old acquaintance. I didn't want to border you with the past. Guillaume's expression softened as he realized the weight of her revelation. You don't have to carry it alone. Tell me, Ifeoma. I want to understand. Ifeoma grappled with the internal turmoil, torn between the familiarity of Ikeokike and the stability Guillaume offered. In the quiet of the morning, with Guillaume busy ironing his clothes for work, Ifeoma made a difficult decision. She stepped out onto the balcony, took a deep breath, and dialed Ikeokike's number in Nigeria. The phone rang, and Ikeokike's voice reverberated through the line, Ifeoma, is that you? Yes, it's me, Ifeoma replied, her voice, tinged with uncertainty. I've been trying to reach you for so long. Why did you disappear like that? Ikeokike's tone held a mix of hurt and frustration. Ifeoma hesitated before responding, I had to move on, Ike. Life took me in a different direction. Moved on? With another man? Ikeokike's voice grew sharper, the bitterness evident. Ifeoma took a deep breath, the weight of her choices heavy on her shoulders. Yes, Ike. I found someone else, someone who could offer me stability and security. There was a pause on the other end, and then Ikeokike exploded, with anger, stability? Security? Is that what you chose, over our love? You know how much I loved you, Ifeoma. Ike, you have to understand. It wasn't an easy choice, Ifeoma pleaded, her voice trembling. Easy or not, you betrayed us. You betrayed me, Ikeokike retorted, the hurt evident in his words. I didn't mean to hurt you, Ike. Circumstances forced my hand, Ifeoma explained, her eyes welling up with tears. Circumstances? What circumstances? Ikeokike's voice rose, frustration, giving way to anger. I found myself in a different place, a different life in Paris. Guillaume offered me a way out, a chance at a stable future, Ifeoma confessed. Guillaume? That old man? You chose an old man over me? Ikeokike's disbelief cut through the distance. He's not just an old man. He cares for me, Ike. He's been there for me when I needed someone, Ifeoma defended her choice, her voice shaky. Fine, Ifeoma. Enjoy your stable future with your old man. I hope it's worth it, Ikeokike spat out, bitterness, dripping from his words. The line went silent, leaving Ifeoma standing on the balcony, the weight of her past and present, converging. Guillaume, oblivious to the conversation, continued with his morning routine inside. As Ikeokike hung up, Ifeoma felt a mixture of relief and guilt. Okiokike, you will always remain in my heart. No one will take your place, she promised herself. The solemn promise reflected how challenging it was for her to detach from Okiokike after the intense phone call with him. In normal circumstances, she could have married him. She knew how Okiokike would spread the news in the village, how she got married to a white man to have residential papers to stay in France. For Okiakite, Ifeoma was just in a marriage of convenience, Guillaume was a ladies' man. The warmth of his smile, the comfort of his presence, they offered comfort in the face of the emotional turmoil that threatened to consume her. Yet, with every passing moment, the burden of her promise to Okiakite pressed upon her. Guillaume, oblivious to the inner conflict brewing within his wife, continued to go about his day with a sense of routine. One evening, as they sat in the cozy living room, Guillaume engrossed in a book and Ifeoma lost in her thoughts, the unspoken tension between them reached its peak, the communication in the house dried up like a lake in the desert. The ambience in the house crackled with unspoken words, and negative energy gripped the hearts of the husband and wife like a tornado, pulling them apart. Finally, Guillaume looked up from his book and met Ifeoma's gaze. 
I Fioma, is everything okay? he asked, concern etching his features. She hesitated, grappling with the words that lingered unspoken. Guillaume, there's something I need to share with you. His expression shifted from curiosity to a mixture of anticipation and apprehension. Unlistening, he encouraged. Taking a deep breath, Ifeoma began confessing her past love affair, emotions, and the recent call from Okiakaik. Guillaume listened in silence, looking at her struggle to voice each word. When she finished, a heavy silence settled between them. Guillaume's gaze held a mix of understanding and empathy, and for a moment, Ifeoma braced herself to hear what he had to say. Guillaume broke the silence, his voice calm yet filled with a depth of emotion. Ifeoma, we all carry pieces of our past within us. It's a part of who we are. I chose you, knowing that you had a life before me. His words, rather than stoking the flames of conflict, extinguished the tension that had gripped the room. Ifeoma felt a sense of gratitude for the man who stood by her, willing to accept the troubles of her heart and her mistakes. Days turned into weeks, and the echoes of that conversation lingered in their minds like the rhythmic beats of drums for wrestlers. Ifeoma, ensnared in the labyrinth of her sentiments, grappled with the poignant duality of emotions, the enduring love she cradled for Okiakike, reminiscent of a cherished melody, and the sense of stability and belonging she discovered within the arms of Guillaume found herself entangled in a dangerous love triangle. One day, as they strolled down to the Garden of Luxembourg in Paris, hand in hand, a man appeared in front of them and it was Okiakaik with Mama Damour her former boss at Siva d'Afrique restaurant. Ifeoma was in shock to see the man she left behind in Nigeria, in the camp of her enemy. The big question though was how he managed to get down to France. She remembered having confided some secrets to Mama Damour about him, how she loved him, his kindness in sponsoring her trip to Paris, and the blood oath both of them took to remain as lovers and couple forever. It was her first time visiting Jardin du Luxembourg and Guillaume was giving her a tour of the place for her to appreciate the beauty of Paris. The Jardin du Luxembourg, also known as the Luxembourg Gardens, is a lush oasis nestled in the heart of Paris, France. Spread across 23 hectares on the grounds of the Luxembourg Palace, the gardens are a haven of tranquility and beauty, attracting both locals and tourists seeking respite from the bustling city. As Guillaume and Ifeoma entered the Luxembourg Gardens, wrought iron gates adorned with gold accents welcomed them into a world of enchantment. The symmetrical layout of perfectly manicured lawns and gravel pathways creates a sense of order and elegance. Tall, ancient chestnut trees stand sentinel, their sprawling branches providing pockets of shade. The centerpiece of the garden is the Grand Basin, a large octagonal pond where children float miniature sailboats. Surrounding the pond are carefully arranged flower beds bursting with vibrant colors. During spring, a riot of tulips, daffodils, and hyacinths carpet the grounds, while summer sees roses in full bloom, releasing their sweet fragrance into the air. Statues and sculptures, remnants of a bygone era, adorn the garden, each telling a story of history and art. The Medici Fountain, a serene pool surrounded by classical statues and guarded by a regal lion, adds to the timeless ambience. Beyond its aesthetic allure, the Luxembourg Gardens hold deep cultural and historical significance for Parisians. Created in the early 17th century at the behest of Marie de Medici, the gardens have witnessed centuries of change and transformation. They stand as a legacy of the city's commitment to preserving green spaces amid urban expansion. Parisians flock to the Luxembourg Gardens for various activities. Students gather in clusters to study under the shade of trees, while fitness enthusiasts jog along the gravel paths. Families congregate around the playgrounds, and chess enthusiasts engage in friendly battles near the central terrace. The Luxembourg Gardens serve as a living canvas for art and culture. Open-air concerts and performances grace the garden, infusing it with the melodies of classical music or the rhythm of contemporary beats. The annual Fête de la Musique, a citywide music celebration, finds a home within these verdant confines. For tourists, the Luxembourg Gardens offer a serene retreat, a place to immerse themselves in the Parisian way of life. The juxtaposition of the historic Luxembourg Palace against the vibrant flora creates a picturesque scene that encapsulates the city's timeless charm.
In essence, the Jardin du Luxembourg isn't just a garden, it's a living masterpiece that weaves together the threads of nature, history, and modern life, making it an integral part of the soul of Paris. The charm of this garden did not help Ifioma overcome the shadow of Okiakike, a chiaroscuro of emotions painting the canvas of her destiny. As Ifioma shared her worries with Guillaume after their walk in the Luxembourg Gardens, the mysterious reappearance of Okiakike and Mama d'Amour haunted her thoughts like a lingering shadow. Guillaume, noticing her distress, grew concerned and pressed her to reveal the cause of her unease. Ifioma hesitated, torn between the man she had married and the past that had resurfaced unexpectedly. She didn't tell him he saw Okiakite. A few days later, Ifioma sought solace in prayer. Her friends from Lagley's Pentecote gathered to pray for her and Guillaume's marriage, seeking divine intervention. Unbeknownst to them, a betrayal festered within their circle. Rosemary, a woman in her forties, and the group's leader, succumbed to Mama D'Amour's promises of financial gain. Despite being close to Pastor Ellie, known as Mummy in the church, Rosemary betrayed her fellow prayer warriors by reporting every secret to Mama D'Amour. This unexpected betrayal not only jeopardized their prayers, but also cast doubt on the sincerity of their spiritual efforts. As the prayer group fervently sought divine guidance against the perceived enemy threatening Ifioma and Guillaume's union, Rosemary's treacherous actions set the stage for a revelation that would test the congregation's faith. Within the spiritual group, Rosemary used her position to spread a false prophecy in the church. She falsely prophesied the imminent divorce of Ifioma and Guillaume, claiming that Okiakike was the divine choice for Ifioma as her husband. Rosemary asserted that she received this revelation during a special prayer session with the angel of God, causing discord among the congregants. Marie de Ries, Ifioma's best friend, sensed the deceit and warned her against trusting the members of the church, especially Pastor Elijah Ellie, who was rumored to engage in questionable practices. Pastor Elijah Ellie was skilled at organizing false miracles, making the blind see, the lame walk, and claiming people with cancer were cured after his prayers. I decree the daughters of darkness to run out of you, was how he purportedly expelled evil spirits from some sick members of the church. Additionally, he was known for his generosity, lending money to poor members from the church's offerings and tithes without interest. This made it challenging to convince zealous church members that he was a dubious pastor. The next day, Rosemary, rumored to be Pastor Elijah Ellie's side chick and a staunch member of the church, took it upon herself to invite Okiakite to the prayer session, completely disregarding Ifioma's feelings and consent. This unilateral decision became a source of significant embarrassment for the prayer group, introducing an element of discord among its members. As Okiakike joined the gathering, tension filled the air, and the once unified purpose of the prayer sessions appeared to be falling apart. Before starting the intercessory prayers, Rosemary, the person behind this secret plan, announced that the night's prayer would focus on forgiveness. Her seemingly innocent statement hit a deeper agenda and the atmosphere within the group became charged with unspoken conflict. When Ifioma entered the prayer room, she felt a knot tighten in her stomach. The atmosphere seemed tense, and her eyes widened as she saw Okiakike seated among the familiar faces of her prayer group. Suppressing a gasp, she turned to Rosemary, the apparent culprit, with a furrowed brow. Rosemary, what is the meaning of this? Why is Okiakike here? Ifioma rebuked her. Rosemary avoided eye contact, fumbling with her words. I thought. I thought it was time for forgiveness. You know, healing, Rosemary pleaded. Ifioma's eyes flashed with frustration. Forgiveness? Healing? You invited him without even consulting me? That's not your decision to make. I just felt it was right. The Lord works in mysterious ways. The Lord? Or Mama D'Amour's manipulation? What game are you playing? Other members looked uncomfortable, shifting in their seats. Maybe we should focus on forgiveness tonight, one member said, and Marie, Therese, who was there hushed her down. Ifioma raising her voice said, Forgiveness? I trusted you all, and now my past is here, uninvited. Ifioma, please, let's talk. I came to seek forgiveness, Okiakite pleaded. Ifioma shot him a withering glance. You lost that privilege long ago, Ifioma yelled at him. 
The atmosphere in the prayer room lingered with discomfort as Ifioma stormed out, followed by Marie Therese. Meanwhile, back at home, a surprise awaited Ifioma. To her astonishment, Guillaume was in the kitchen, putting the finishing touches on a meal. The aroma of the carefully prepared dishes wafted through the air. On the dining table stood a simple yet elegant arrangement, a bunch of flowers in a white vase, a subtle celebration of Ifioma's 27th birthday. Marie Therese bid them a quiet farewell, leaving the couple in their sweet home. Ifioma was in a bad mood. Guillaume, sensing the strain, approached Ifioma with a genuine smile. Happy birthday, my love. I thought we could have a quiet celebration at home, Guillaume greeted her with a kiss. Ifioma, still recovering from what happened in the church, managed a faint smile. You remembered? She asked him. Of course. How could I forget? Now, sit, and let me serve you something special. As they settled at the table, the atmosphere shifted from tension to a more intimate moment. The soft glow of candlelight and the aroma of the carefully prepared meal created a moment of respite. It was a simple celebration, infused with the subtle charm of French romance that colored the room. She was prepared to give him the warm sweetness between her legs. Guillaume could see it. Her eyes held a warmth and an unspoken invitation. He carried her to the bedroom. Soft hues of cream and lavender adorned the walls. Large French windows adorned with flowing curtains allowed the moonlight to cascade gently into the room, casting a soft glow. A plush, king-sized bed stood in the middle, adorned with crisp white linens and a medley of throw pillows in rich, deep colors. The headboard, a rustic wooden frame, added a touch of warmth to the room. The fragrance of vanilla and lavender lingered in the air, emanating from strategically placed scented candles. On one side of the room, a vintage wooden dresser showcased framed photographs capturing moments of their journey together, snapshots of laughter, shared dinners, and stolen glances. A quaint reading nook with a comfortable armchair and a small bookshelf invited moments of quiet reflection. The soft, ambient lighting cast a gentle glow in the room, emanating from the bedside lamps strategically placed to create a cocoon of warmth. As the soft hues enveloped the space, a carefully curated playlist of their favorite tunes played in the background, adding a melodic touch to the intimate atmosphere. On a small table near the window, a tray of delicately arranged strawberries beckoned, their vibrant red hues juxtaposed against the subdued tones of the room. Nestled beside the tempting fruits was a bottle of chilled champagne, glistening with condensation, ready to be uncorked and enjoyed. In this cozy setting, bathed in soft light and accompanied by the gentle music of their favorite melodies, a moment when his body touched her naked body, massaging her from toe to her hair. He whispered sweet words into her ears, giving her a passionate kiss. I like the way you touch me, she whispered, her words carrying the tone of a woman in love. A woman who wanted her man to make love to her. She was wet for him, but he wouldn't go down there, allowing for more time to excite her. His ran through her thighs and shook her whole being. She moaned and begged him to come inside her. You are the best of the best, she screamed. Guillaume tenderly held her hand and replied, And you, my love, are the beating heart of my existence. Together, we'll overcome any storm that comes our way. Ifioma smiled, her heart warmed by his words. With you, every journey is an adventure, and every moment is a treasure. Guillaume pressed a gentle kiss on her lips, whispering, Our love is a story written in the stars, and I am grateful for every chapter, my dearest Ifioma.